Hey, it's Mike here, and today, light therapy research on how different colors affect different health areas or different health ailments. This video looks at about 40 studies covering everything from nerve regeneration and wrinkles to depression and thyroid function. We're gonna cover headaches, cognitive function in young people, and heck, this meta-analysis when it comes to skin health, which didn't even have conflicts of interest, states that LED light for skin health, quote, showed outstanding levels of effectiveness, various areas like improved skin rejuvenation. So let's just get right to it. And I do want to mention that by popular request, my recent ebook, Level 5 Vegan, A Guide for Long-Term Vegans, will soon have an audiobook version. So stay tuned for that. Anyway, let's get to what light even is. This is important and we'll cover it fast. Light is electromagnetic radiation. And I think it's important to distinguish that we not only have the rainbow here of visible light that we can see, which makes up a tiny part of the spectrum of electromagnetic light, which covers everything from like X-rays to gamma rays and others. But we also have that infrared and ultraviolet light that we can't see below and above our visible light spectrum that various animals can see, it's like pigeons that can see ultraviolet light exposing beautiful patterns on pigeons who would otherwise just be ugly and boring. And then we have cold-blooded reptiles that can see that heat in terms of infrared light. And I had to wonder, why can't we see infrared light? Well, we are warm-blooded, so our own heat might sort of mess with our sensors, giving us blurry heat vision. So we're just left with our good old friend, Roy G. Bev, those colors of the rainbow. And one other important point that I think is good to think about as we go up the spectrum of light is that Blue light and our daylight is very stimulating. It's what we're used to getting midday. But then as the sun goes down and the atmosphere angle gets lower, just that red light gets through. And that's why all of our artificial light can be so harmful and why I use like redshift programs like Flux. And as we get to the really good health research here in a sec, I just have to mention that because there's science on light being good on one topic and one health area, it doesn't mean that they all work for all things. And I just want people to be aware of like light therapy scams that might be out there. You know, make sure it's backed up. And then also a lot of these things are great adjunct or additional therapies to other medicine. I wouldn't just do light therapy and like reject all other medicine. <laughs> now you've heard that. Now that I've dissed all the claimers, we can start here at the bottom of the light spectrum, you know, below what we can see, but still used a lot in therapy with infrared light. Infrared has absolutely blown my mind with how many benefits there are. And I will say some of these studies, you might see a combination of red and infrared light. So there's gonna be a little bit of blurred lines there. But the interesting first topic is just how infrared light can affect nerve cells, which is incredible from this paper. Nerve cells respond particularly well to infrared, which has been proposed for a range of neurostimulation and neuromodulation applications with recent progress in neural stimulation and regeneration. Yes, from this paper, infrared directly promoted nerve regeneration, probably from, as they say, mitochondrial metabolism increasing. So it's like this infrared light actually hits the mitochondria or powerhouse of the cell. And it's like, I got some more energy to work with. Let's ramp things up. And this has been tested in the realm of diabetic neuropathy, where nerves are essentially starved and you get pain and tingling. But but the results have been mixed from this first one. Infrared light was no more effective than the sham treatment for diabetic neuropathy. But to this second study, four treatments of photon stimulation resulted in significant improvements in some pain, quality, sensation, etc. Because of all this promising nerve info, a lot of researchers have been looking in the realm of animal studies for answers. I'm not a huge fan of these, and a lot of times they don't translate. But just to share some of what they've found using transcranial or through the cranium infrared light laser treatments, they found that they reduce the tau tangles and the beta amyloid plaques in mice, which are two hallmarks of Alzheimer's. And as I say, it appears to stimulate the brain sort of waste clearance as one mechanism, but we definitely need some human studies on that. But moving to humans in terms of Parkinson's, which is essentially death of neurons in the substantia nigra part of the brain, which is connected to movement and dopamine. We have mixed results, but multiple pilot studies like this one have shown improvement in Parkinson's in terms of mobility, cognition, balance, and fine motor skill. 
with no side effects, but not a randomized control trial. It doesn't have any placebo group. Another relevant area here is traumatic brain injury. And we have this study, which gave people 10 treatments of infrared over two months and reported improved cognition, mood dysregulation, anxiety, irritability, headache, and sleep disturbance. But again, it was lacking a placebo group. And continuing along the lines of brain function, they just took healthy adults, shined infrared into their brain and thought, are they getting any smarter? Did their cognition improve? And this time they actually did have a placebo or a sham group. And the results, yeah, from this chart, they saw, what is that, like a 10% improvement in cognitive function? What would that be, like a 10-point IQ boost for the average person? I'll take it. Hey guys, I hope this isn't distracting, but from now on, I will be wearing this and living that brain-boosting laser life. There's nothing you can do to stop me. Yeah, never mind. it hurt my head. And we will cover light for headaches in a second, but why might have this helped? Well, they point to increased oxygen as the reason with their neuroimaging method revealing large effects on prefrontal oxygenation during cognitive enhancement post laser. And back to traumatic brain injury patients, this was corroborated from another study which found that it again increased oxygenation in the brain as well as cognitive function. The larger studies are certainly warranted. Can we just say that large Larger studies are always warranted. Anyway, they push the ethical envelope a little bit here with this next one saying infrared treatment increased brain activity in people in a vegetative state. But now I can't help but wonder if these type of transcranial light treatments might be a key to helping certain people get out of comas. I mean, is somebody gonna combine AI and like brain light blasting to solve this? Are you watching this person? All right, now let's move right up on the spectrum, even though there's so much more research there, to red light. And I'm just gonna throw orange light in there as well, because sometimes the studies do too. I think it's important to note this chart, which shows how different wavelengths penetrate into the skin based on their length. And, and infrared actually goes deeper than the chart. And just in terms of a Petri dish study, if you take human skin samples and you expose them to red and infrared light, you get various improvements like improved dermal fibers, pro collagen and elastin. And we have a ton of studies showing red light therapy for just skin aging, wrinkles, etc. And a lot of them are connected to industry. Some of them are a bit more legit though, like this one, which is a controlled trial on over 100 people. They say the light treated subjects experience significant improved skin complexion, feeling, better roughness, better collagen density, and a blinded clinical evaluation of photographs confirm significant improvement. And there are actually some studies out there on scarring, which is interesting, like this one after an operation. Treated scars showed greater improvement in observer rating, scar pliability, flexibility, etc. And you can see this woman's right versus left ear and the one that was treated to me, looks significantly better. Next up, we have hair, and Lindy did make me purchase an unnamed uh, red light hair helmet before I had looked at much of this research, but I have to say, uh, there's quite a bit. Here's a study on women with androgenic or hormone-based alopecia slash hair loss, and they saw 51% hair growth improvement over the placebo group. Next, we have this study on male pattern baldness, and they saw a 35% increased hair growth over placebo. And then finally, to tie it together, this meta-analysis of a ton of studies also corroborates. How is this working? Various websites say it's an increase in blood flow, blah, 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 but to get a little bit more technical from this paper, this light therapy activates cytochrome C oxidase and increases mitochondrial electron transport. But yeah, it's, but yeah, it's that mitochondrial energy stuff again increases ATP and reverses dormant hair follicles back to growth stage. And then from this other paper, it appears to actually reverse the miniaturization of follicles that happens during hair loss. They just shrink until eventually they're not growing hair anymore. And red light also appears to help the thyroid. We have this initial pilot study looking at lower level laser therapy, this red light, and found that it promotes improvement of thyroid function with a decreased need for LT4 medication and other benefits. And this later study found lowered medication need for autoimmune hypothyroidism. These are smaller studies and they need to be replicated. Again, that's my new mantra. But let's move right up the spectrum to yellow light, which I have to say is probably the least studied of any of these light 
colors. Perhaps the main area of research is once again, skin health. And again, from this chart, yellow doesn't make it quite as far as red and definitely not as far as infrared, but is there still a benefit? Well, this study took human skin cells and then artificially aged them by exposing them to UVB light, ultraviolet light. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then treated it with yellow light. And the yellow light reduced oxidative stress and increased pro-collagen recovery. Interesting stuff. And then we have this Korean study on 40 people where they saw an improvement in skin wrinkles, but a decrease in melanin, our skin's pigment that it literally determines how dark our skin is and what race we are. And next we have this study, which pulsed yellow light and supports an improvement saying it is safe and effective and non-painful for improving photo aging. But let's talk more about this melanin inhibition effect because melanin, you know, it's literally blocking UV damage, helping prevent cancer. And other studies also mention that yet yellow light inhibits melanogenesis, down-regulating melanin content. But this means that in certain cases where you have hyperpigmentation or melasma, which is a buildup of melanin, yellow light might be an effective treatment. And that's what's cool about this field is that there's just so much potential for research that has yet to occur. I mean, somebody please do that study. Anyway, let's move right up the spectrum to green light. Are you ever sitting at a traffic light and then as it turns green, you feel your headache lift as you hit the gas pedal. Could it be the green light in the traffic light? Uh, probably not in that case. It's probably just the fact that you can finally go, but it appears that narrow band green light might help with migraines. This first one is lacking a placebo group and is self-reported, but they essentially took about 200 people and had them do a migraine diary for six weeks and then give them green light therapy and have them do a migraine diary for another six weeks. And looking at over 3000 migraine attacks, headache improved overall in 55% of attacks. And they note some sort of hyper responders that saw 82% improvement in attacks. And they also looked at anxiety and sleep metrics and saw you know, quite a bit of improvement there as well. However, uh, quite a few of the authors were employed by or connected to lamp companies, green lamp companies, trying to get that green. You know, maybe it was accurate, maybe it wasn't. <laughs> anyway, on to this next one, we have actually a placebo group this time and the results were wild, although it was only about 30 people. This set of charts shows headache days per month comparing before to white light and before to green light and day yum. Now that's really a monthly representation of suffering and a really statistically significant 60% roughly reduction for acute and chronic and total headaches with green light. And this next set of charts just very clearly compares white and green light from baseline, looking at migraine pain intensity, frequency of headaches, pain duration, ability to fall asleep, all of those wildly improved. And in terms of conflicts for this one, it seems a bit better. It was supported by like a pain Center. However, a couple of the authors have a patent pending for a green lamp. So now what could the mechanisms possibly be here? How could green light reduce headache intensity? Well, back to that original migraine study, the researchers say that the electrical signals that the eyes send to the brain are smallest in response to narrow band green light compared to other colors. And that electrical signals generated in the cortex from this green light are significantly smaller than other colors as well. So maybe it's just chilling the brain down a little bit. Anyway, what about actual pain? If that is the case, can we see any benefit? Well, annoyingly, we have another mouse study. Sorry about that. But these researchers do claim to have outlined the pathway in which green light reduces pain. And it's all complicated and we have so much to cover, but you know, maybe in the future, opioids could be reduced or even replaced with some green light therapy. But thankfully we actually have some human related studies here in the realm of fibromyalgia and green light by the same researchers as that second headache study. And fibromyalgia is a sort of mysterious pain disorder that is often accompanied by some other bad symptoms like brain fog and inability to sleep. It wasn't huge at 21 people, but they had them do a white light or a green light period and they had pain on a scale of one to 10. And they found that the green light dropped their pain scale from 8.4 to 4.9, holy crap. And that's for white compared to green. And also these charts show the types of pain that decreased like stabbing pain down by half. And in terms of emotions and green light, we have a small pilot study where they tried white or narrow 
banned green light in psychotherapy sessions and they found improved positive and decreased negative feelings in the green compared to white light. So our psychotherapy session begins now. Sit back in your seat. How does that make you feel? Annoyed because I'm not continuing on with the video. <laughs> Next up on the spectrum is blue light. And this is again, that midday intense blue that I feel like you know we have an evolutionary connection to. It's what we've been exposed to during the day. Probably not nice to be exposed to that when you're tired though. Well, that can make you pretty irritable and also you know exposing yourself to blue light from your phone at night not gonna be good. But I really don't think it's fair to call blue light bad, which a lot of people have, and why I see these so-called biohackers, you know, walking around all day with their sort of red-tinted glasses, looking like idiots and drinking their butter coffee. Like, kidding, I don't really care about that that much, just that it could prevent an appropriate level of wakefulness midday. For a study, too much blue light can decrease the lifespan of fruit flies dramatically, and they believe it has to do with the stress response. This is not a surprise because walking into Walmart after 7 p.m. getting blasted by those bright overhead lights, it definitely feels like it shortens my lifespan. But again, not all bad, just to hop back into the land of Petri dishes, exposing the insulin producing cells of our pancreas to blue light in a Petri dish, stimulates insulin secretion to the same degree as chemicals which are called secretagogues, so notable. But perhaps the biggest study on this is a massive review looking at a bunch of other studies on how blue light affects young people and their cognition, their attention, etc. They say, quote, blue light exposure can positively affect cognitive performance, alertness, and reaction time. This could have sports benefits, but it could also have negative effects such as decreased sleep quality and duration. So it's about getting it when you need it. And I know going into like a school facility early in the morning and getting hit with those fluorescent overhead lights. Uh, yeah, that's not gonna help anyone, especially a prepubescent teen that needs 32 hours of sleep a day. <laughs> anyway, let's get on to acne, speaking of pubescence. This review on the topic mentions that, well, studies have been a bit lower quality so far. In general, we see a positive effect. Looking at study to study, most are good. Some didn't really find a benefit over placebo though. And this is where it gets interesting to contrast yellow versus blue light. Remember the yellow was suppressing melanin, that skin pigment proliferation, but then it appears that blue could increase it. And that brings me to vitiligo, which is what Michael Jackson had. It's where your body stops producing melanin, usually from an autoimmune disease. And as this paper mentions, a retrospective study used blue light to actually induce repigmentation in 30 patients with vitiligo. All right, now let's move up the spectrum to purple and violet, and I'll just throw them together because the research does that sometimes and yeah. And this study looked at chicks as in baby chickens and humans and found that violet light suppressed myopia progression, which is of course nearsightedness from your eye becoming too oblong. Now, we don't even need to cover the animal study part because they got a bunch of myopic students and gave them either contact lenses or glasses that blocked violet light or let that violet light through. And here is a chart of the results. It suppressed axial length elongation, which is essentially just elongation. <laughs> In the interest of time, let's hit on white light, which is just all of these different light colors combined. We have some interesting depression results. And I'm also gonna be including studies for bright light here, which is generally just a bright white light. And this is where a really important point comes in and how bright plays a role because an office, you might be getting 100 to 500 lumens. You might think maybe it's twice that outside in the sunlight. Nope, 30,000 to 100,000 lumens in direct sunlight. So you can imagine what our brain evolved to be used to being outside versus what we get inside and how that can mess with our circadian rhythm. Let's hop right onto this study. It was seasonal affected disorder and light. They found improvement in mood, which can be detected with just 20 minutes, but 40 minutes is better and 60 minutes didn't really improve it further from there. So. 40 minutes. No, that's just one study out there, but we have so many and this review shows just how far it's come. We're talking about light being the quote, first line treatment for individuals with seasonal affective disorder because of its low side effect profile and high response rate of about 67% of patients 
with mild, sad, and 40% with severe sad. Yeah, because if your condition is named that, you're definitely gonna feel great about it. And we can even move to non-seasonal major depressive disorder. And this study took about 120 people, divided them up into various groups with light and SSRI, fluoxetine medication, or both, and the results will blow your mind. Looking to this chart, the people with SSRIs only didn't really perform better than placebo, maybe a little bit, and to be fair, they usually do in other studies, but the light treatment crushed it and did almost as good as the SSRIs plus light. How does this work? Well, bright light stimulates our eyeballs and our hypothalamus, which controls our circadian rhythm and how much melatonin we produce, which of course regulates sleepiness. And this could have to do with neurotransmitters like serotonin as well from this paper. Genetic vulnerability and chronobiological factors, time biological factors, and brain process alterations, including things like serotonin or genic neurotransmission could play a role. And yes, our serotonin levels are supposed to go up during the day and down at night in this nice sort of sine wave. But looking at people in depression, you can see that their waves are a little confused. They're on their own random roller coaster of not enough serotonin in the right place at the right time. So you can blast people with enough light to convince them that daytime actually exists when it exists and then you can balance it back out in some cases, apparently a lot of the cases. And that is absolutely wild and a great reminder to stay connected with nature and that we evolved not having artificial light and actually being outdoors. Unfortunately, we have seasons and stuff too, I know. Finally, we have ultraviolet light up past our visible light spectrum that we can see. We have UVA, UVB, and then we have UVC, which doesn't make it through the atmosphere. And think UVA is A for aging, and B is B for burning because A penetrates deeper and B hits the surface more. So they're both damaging us at different depths, but they at least are helping us make a vitamin D. Well, I have a whole video on sunscreen, etc., and how uh, I'm at least not personally gonna be relying on sunlight for my vitamin D. Cause yeah, let's not forget that uh, UV light is literally a carcinogen from the WHO. You know, It's what causes most cases of skin cancer. It also causes aging, but that doesn't mean that particular focused certain types of UV radiation can't help with certain issues. As this review mentions, quote, several human skin diseases like psoriasis, vitiligo, atopic dermatitis, which is eczema, and localized scleroderma can be treated with solar radiation, heliotherapy, or artificial UV radiation. Yes, I actually have a family member who is receiving UVB treatment for psoriasis and is already seeing improvement. And yes, a large meta-analysis found that it tends to result in 75% improvement in psoriasis score on average. So that is wild. And for a final UV1, let's look at UVA. And this really tiny study found that in people with sort of severe cases of COVID, if you put UVA down their throat, it decreases the viral count of SARS-CoV-2. All right, now there's one last wavelength of light I wanna mention, and that is darkness. <laughs> I don't even think I need any studies to back up the idea that there are times you just need to get away from light to sleep, and that might even be as important as getting blasted with bright light for things like seasonal affective disorder, who knows? So embrace the darkness. In the end, it amazes me how much research we already have on different light spectrums, frequencies, and their health conditions. I mean, who would have thought that, you know, if you if you blast your thyroid with some red light, you know, it's gonna probably do better than if you blast it with some yellow light. And that in general, infrared light, in many cases, red light is going to straight up feed your mitochondria and upregulate it and help it heal you in many ways, like skin, help potentially keep hair growth going, and round of applause for green light and migraines potentially, as well as fibromyalgia. I'd love to see more research on that, but you know, it's huge if we can be giving people green light instead of opioids. And then all of this just reminds me that we are creatures of planet Earth that evolved with certain cycles of the sun going up and down. And so of course, seasonal affective disorder can be heavily 
really benefited from just getting enough light at the right times. You know, and that's why blue and white light might amp us up a little bit and red light might chill us out in certain circumstances. Anyway, let me know if I miss anything. I'm sure I missed some connection between some spectrum of light and some disease or cool health effects. So comment down below. And of course, feel free to like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.